Hello everyone. Uh, please welcome Martin Durant with us. And Martin is going to talk about all you need is SAR, uh, parallel access to remote HTF5, TIFF, GRIP2 and others. Hmm, this is going to be an interesting talk. And uh, a couple of things uh, I want to mention that this whole session is governed by Parita Global COC. Uh, so please make sure that you are there to COC and please don't violate the COC, otherwise I need to remove you. And the whole session has been recorded and it will be available to you in the following day. Uh, over to you, Martin. And could you please give us a short bio about yourself? That would be wonderful. Okay, will do. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Martin Durant. I work for Anaconda and have done for six years. I'm in the open source team. I work on uh, Dask file systems, uh, file formats, intake, and uh, streams, uh, a few different projects that you might have heard of. And today I'll be talking about ZAR and accessing data in the cloud that is not stored in formats that are meant for the cloud. Okay, so here's a brief contents page. Um, there are formats such as HDF5. Now HDF5, I will mention multiple times, it's the first format that we started off with, but the, um, the same applies for several other formats. Loads of data is stored in this format. It's been around for a long time. It's well established. It's formalized in various standard docu um, prescriptions. And so lots of providers of data like to store their array or tabular data in HDF5 format. There are actually lots of kinds of data format out there, and they might all be binary efficient. They might be specialized to particular use cases but they basically store arrays. Now in the modern era, we have much more data than we can possibly download, more data than we can fit into a sing simple laptop's memory. So we want to move compute to data. That is, we want to use resources in the cloud to work on data in the cloud because the data is too expensive to move around. There are formats for storing data that do this very well. And they do it well because they have nice features such as metadata that is separate from the data itself and easy to understand, the ability to access chunks of the data in parallel, uh, the ability to make an object that represents the data and pass it between processes so that you can distribute your compute without having to move data around. They should be pluggable. You should be able to fetch the parts both in parallel and concurrently, that is to ameliorate latency. So these are all nice desirable things that the established formats like the HDF5 don't have. So what can we do about this? Well, an obvious thing you could do is to transform your data into a modern format. Uh, for example, look at the Pangeo Forge project that does this. However, it does mean that you end up with a whole new copy of your data. It might be a more optimized copy, but it's still duplicating the storage requirements. You could come up with some service that can read the data locally and serve it to those that wish to see it. That means you have to um, invest in new infrastructure, some kind of query system. You have to stand up new stuff. Or you could maybe, for some very specific use cases, code particular drivers, particular packages that can deal with that specific type of data. Or you can do what we're going to show in this particular uh, presentation, which is to use ZAR that I will introduce and reference file system, which I'll also introduce, to load the data from its native format in a way that is friendly to cloud processing. So I'm going to go into the detail of how this actually works. First of all, here is an HDF5 file. And again, different types of binary storage have similar properties. In an HDF5 file, you have some metadata. This might be spread around the file in various places here marked in purple. And you also have binary data blocks. These might also be interspersed. There might be one of them. There might be many of them. There might be the same size of each other. There's, there's a whole lot of different possibilities. Now, one of these binary blocks, it actually contains a C buffer. It will be a multidimensional contiguous block. This will be encoded, filtered, compressed, but basically it's just a binary block that is some representation of a C buffer. And a C buffer is the same thing that NumPy understands. It's the same thing that all computing frameworks work with. 
Okay, so that's the first piece of the puzzle. The second piece is the czar package. This is initially um, a Python package, but exists actually now for several languages, including Java, JavaScript, Julia, uh, some others. It has many of the features that we want from a, a cloud native uh, storage system. You have metadata that is stored in short pieces of JSON, so you can actually look at these and understand them. The chunks of a particular data set are stored in a hierarchy, so you can subset to the particular array within a data set just by walking down a file system directory path. Within that directory, you have chunks. You can access these chunks individually. They're separate files. And how these are encoded is very simply specified in this separate package called numcodex. Basically, you can encode, you can compress with things like gzip, things we understand. And it's all specified in one place and very easy to understand. And finally, because I happen to be the author of FSpec, this is how I became involved in Czar, it works well with FSpec. Uh, FSpec is used by MediPy data. Well, I'm going to describe FSpec in just a moment, but the fact that this works is a critical piece. So moving on to what FSpec is, it is a library, a Python library that gives you uh, API access to storage systems across many different storage backends, which might be local file system, it might be HDFS or something on your cluster. It might be cloud object stores like S3 or Google Cloud Storage, it might be Dropbox, there's quite a few of these. All of them have the same methods. So from the calling applications point of view, you don't need to know what that storage system is. It looks and behaves the same. This uh, means that you can now access any of these storage, storage uh, backends without having to worry about it. Furthermore, you can distribute the FSpec objects themselves on a cluster. That again is important if you're going to distribute workloads across a cluster. And it comes with uh, guarantees that you can request many files concurrently for high latency systems, such as again, S3 or Google Storage or Azure. Um, and it comes with a whole load of utilities that, are, that uh, make it convenient for people to use. Um, it was initially designed for Dask, but is now used by many PyData projects. Finally, reference file system. This is a particular implementation for FSpec, and it enables you to build a virtual file system where each of the paths is defined to be either some data or a reference to a binary block that lives somewhere else. That somewhere else is an arbitrary URL. You give an offset and size within that URL, and you make this look as if it's a file within this file system. So now you have a way of encapsulating random bits of binary data within a file system, all handled by FSpec. Anything that can use FSpec will view this as if it was a file system like anything else, like your local file system. Um, crucially, it's, uh, that makes it um, usable by anything in the PyData system, as I say. And it comes with these nice benefits of being able to read in parallel and concurrently, which are two sides of the, of the um, same coin, but uh, you can ask about that later. That's uh, the difference is subtle. Um, and it comes with a, uh, some extra features that I don't need to go into uh, in, at this point. We can ask about that at the end. So a uh, summary of the things that I've gone over here. With this stack, Czar is able to open a reference file system. It can access binary chunks that are spread over many files, many different file systems possibly, and it views them as if they were a set of files within a particular directory hierarchy, which is exactly what Czar expects for it to be able to construct a data set. Now that now we can pass this data set off to X-Ray and we can process it with Dask or whatever, and everything just works. The only thing that you need to know, the only thing that is missing from this is how do you generate the mapping from path to binary block in some URL? And that is all handled by a package called Kachunk. This is uh, the new name. This is recently released. So uh, we're going to go a little bit into what it does, and then I'll go over some uh, 
demonstrations of the final product. So what Kachunk does, it for, for uh, several file types, we handle HDF, GRIB, uh, FITS, and TIFF at the moment. Those are the things that, that can be used. It reads through those files, and for the various arrays that are encoded, it reads the metadata about what that array is like, its shape, its D-type, how it's encoded, how it's compressed, and it constructs a JSON file that contains this information so that uh, this is the reminder of the picture that we had before. We have a CRA buffer that lives somewhere with some encoded and compression inside this HDF5 file. Now you have a picture that's like this. Kachunk fills in the piece that's in the central box here. It figures out the attributes of a given array. It figures out the types of a given array and stores them in the kind of JSON that Zara expects. And then it encodes each of the chunks so that they appear at a particular path location. Here, the time slash zero, time slash one are two chunks of this array. And Zara understands this structure and it knows that those chunks belong to the same array. And so it can operate on them in parallel when you do a read. Furthermore, you can combine many chunks from many files, uh, concatenate them together or, or what I, whatever kind of merging procedure you need and construct a, an ensemble JSON that points to all of these chunks together so that you can produce a single ZAR dataset that now works over multiple files. In this case, uh, this is just, for example, we, uh, if we have several HDF5 files on the left here that uh, because I'm lazy with copy and paste, all happen to have the same structure. That's not necessarily the case. The task that Kachunk does is to figure out for each of the chunks in each of those files, where does it live within the directory hierarchy that ZAR needs so that you can construct an ensemble data set across all of them. Now you can view many files potentially, and we have an example here where we'll have millions of files and they all live within a single sliceable object that you can then pass to Dask for distributed parallel computing. Okay, so I have a demo and I will show this in a moment. First, I just comment that this demo is recorded because it seemed like a really bad idea to try to uh, do network traffic at the same time as I'm broadcasting via Zoom. So please forgive me, but it was my first take, so it's uh, semi-live. Now, uh, I will press play, and with luck, you can actually hear this. Let me know if the audio isn't working, and then I can narrate it live. So I will show you three simple examples of aggregate data sets produced by Kajunk and using FSpec to pipe their data through ZAR, and uh, we're going to see what that looks like here. So the first one, the first case, we're talking about FITS files, which is an astronomy specific data format. You don't need to know too much of the details here. Indeed, the point of all of this is that different binary file formats are going to feel very similar once we've put them through the process. So let's have a look at this. Now I'm just gonna execute some things and not go into too much detail at first. I'll show you some little detail of what's happening here in a moment. We've opened a data set and it looks like this. Here we have um, some fairly large coordinates. This is X-ray, by the way, for those that aren't used to seeing that. And we can see that the total size, the effective in-memory size, if we wanted to load this whole data set comprising of a few variables into memory would be some 400 gigabytes or so. So too big for my computer to download, but not amazingly massive. So how did this work? Well, let's go into the guts just for a moment here. So I say, um, FSpec is the glue that brings all of these things together. Let's look at the target files. Now these live on Google storage. That's what GCS is here. And they're in a few folders. If we look inside one of these folders, it's a bunch of FITS files. Now we can view these FITS files using the reference file system like so. Again, this is referencing just a particular JSON file containing all of the details of all of the files that it's pointing to. And having loaded that, we can treat this thing like a file system. We can list its contents. Here are some directories. And 
we can look at the contents of one of these directories. These are just normal file system like commands. And we can look at the contents of one of these files. This is a block of JSON of the sort that Zar needs in order to be able to load the array. And we can look at what are the actual references. You can see this is pointing. So for this path within this virtual file system, it's pointing at this original file on uh, Google Storage, and here is the offset and size of that file. So that is how we get a binary chunk out of this. So those are the guts, and up here we made this data set object. So what can we do with this? Well, we can use it like you would for any other uh, X-Array object. We can view this thing. This will pop up in just a second. Now it is downloading some 20 megabytes for each of these frames, but you can see this is a single view over the whole 300, 400 uh, gigabyte data set. I can choose a data point. And if you look carefully after a moment, the picture updates and the sun will go around nice and slowly. This is solar data, by the way, I didn't even mention, because again, the same mechanism will work for Astro data, as you see here, and also for the different file formats. So let's try a second one. This one I have uh, preloaded some things because some of the uh, um, elements of this notebook take a while to uh, happen. But this is, again, using a similar kind of process. In this case, I've written it out longhand. This is a fairly complicated cell here, but I'll talk about that in a moment. It only takes a few seconds to complete. And then we have this data set loaded that looks like this. Again, it has uh, some coordinates, several data variables. Each of these data variables has various attributes that we could look at. Uh, we have some dimensions. Uh, it's a full X-ray data set with lots and lots of detail. And the virtual size of this, that is the size it would take in memory if we wanted to load the whole thing into data set, it, it, into uh, arrays, would be 260. And this time we're talking terabytes. So pretty big. Now, it's in fact so big that um, we will need a helper function here to be able to tell us where in this data set is there actually data, because it turns out a fair amount of this coordinate space is empty, just filled with nans. So there is some code here to do that, and I'm not going to go over it for the sake of time. I'll just skip over it and show you the visualization tool, which again, this is a custom thing. You'll see what this does in a moment when it pops up. This is what it looks like. So make that fit. So this panel on the left here tells me where in my data set I have data for the particular set of parameters I have selected here. So this is satellite imaging, or in fact, satellite coherence data. If I go to a different polarization, you can see that uh, different parts of the map are selected. If I go to a different season or a different coherence, in fact, this one seems to be fairly well populated. So if we zoom in, for example, on Hawaii, and I click, let's say, on here, after a moment, this is pretty big data, we have some nice visualization of a rugged terrain on Hawaii. You can zoom out a little bit here and re-render. And here you can see now, quite complicated volcanic features. So that's pretty cool. Again, this is satellite imaging of the Earth uh, and some, well, many terabytes, let's say, but I can browse it freely here and I can look through the data as I wish. And it, it's really pretty quick. I have an ensemble overview of the whole data set in one go. In this case, we're dealing with whole GeoTIF files. So this was case two. And finally, I will look at uh, another one. This is actually HDF files. In this case, we're looking at chunks within HDF files. So I'll do the same thing as I did again. We have a fairly complicated cell here that's going to load this um, X-ray data set. But once we've done it, and this takes a best part of a minute to do, once we've done it, we will have a reference to some 370,000 HDF files and actually, a, um, will be pointing specifically at chunks within these 370,000 HDF files. So I just let that complete. We can sit around for a moment. Um, once again, this is rather complicated and uh, people will not want to have to type out all of these 
parameters, but uh, we we can probably cope with that. So we'll come back to that in a moment. So here it is. It arrived after some, uh, what's it, 40 seconds-ish. And the size of this thing, again, this is equivalent in memory size, is either 60-some terabytes for the whole data set or 8 terabytes for any one of these uh, variables. And I can do some kind of, I'm just going to execute this for the sake of time. We don't have too much today. Um, I will show you that we can plot some particular part of this data set. This will take a few seconds to come up to. And visualize the data, be able to browse slices from within this data. Uh, in fact, this is running remotely. I could have started up a DAS cluster to be able to do some heavy duty processing on this data, but this is live and this is interactive. So I can zoom in and in a second, it updates all of this data. This is all um, rivers and waterways and I, I can re-render it and browse through the data as I wish. And I could actually do some heavy duty analysis on this. So, okay. So I will show you three. So uh, we are getting towards time. So I'll end with some uh, final thoughts, which is that uh, this gives us a window into data that is in archival formats that don't behave well, uh, not built for cloud systems, but we can essentially do as well as if we transformed all of the data into czar, which is meant for doing exactly that. And um, But we don't have to. We can use the original data without copying it. We can furthermore get ensemble views, uh, aggregate data sets over many inputs. And uh, as a final point, I, um, I mentioned Pangeo Forge as a way of copying data. Pangeo Forge might, it, it will be a good place to actually run the process of generating these reference files to um, look up Pangeo Forge. I don't have time to go into what that is now. There are some things that should be borne in mind. Um, when you do this, you are stuck with whatever chunking the original files had because you're not changing anything, it's staying in the same place. There are some limited things that you can do, but basically you, you cannot reformat the data is what it is. Um, the manner in which I, I mentioned a couple of times, the code that it takes to load this is rather more complex than you might be used to. So the intent is that we will build intake catalogs so that the users of these supermassive data sets don't need to know those details. It will just work. It'll be hidden inside an intake catalog. Uh, this requires a couple of small fixes in intake x-ray that I mean to do next week. It will be quick, I promise. And the, finally, you do need to, at some point, understand the data that you're working with. You need to scan it. You need to figure out uh, where the different pieces of that data, how they fit together. We have put a certain amount of work into automating that, but we haven't covered all possible use cases yet. We're getting there. And finally, uh, for the future, this now works for some binary formats, as, as I already mentioned. We had uh, TIFF there. We had uh, fits, we had HDF, and it also work, we have an example for GRIB, and there are other things that it would work for as soon as we can make the small pieces of code that it takes to scan them. Uh, this is all coded in Python, but the output spec, those JSON files, are architecture language agnostic. You could use them anywhere. There is one example I'm aware of of doing all of this in using Czar in JavaScript. The storage is JSON. JSON doesn't scale amazingly well to enormously big files. So when the reference set itself gets reasonably big, we might have to come up with something else. Particularly, we might not want to load the whole thing into memory at once. Um, and we have some ideas about how we don't necessarily have to scan every file. Maybe we can know where in a target data set a particular chunk should live by the for example, the path names of the original data. It's quite common to encode details about the data in the path names themselves. So we should use that rather than having to scan unless we really have to. And then finally, this idea was presented here because it's all about czar for array data. But actually you could do this kind of thing for other sorts of data where the path matters, such as parquet, 
or where it's really important to be able to find the blocks within some other file. For example, tar compression is one, or even CSV, when you have embedded new lines in CSV uh, records, then you can't necessarily just jump to some part of a massive CSV and be sure that the first new line that you meet is actually a new record. You can only do that by scanning the whole file. So this would be a way to scan it once, store the references, and then for the future, you can now access it in parallel. Uh, that's it. A few minutes for questions. Here are some collaborators. And also a special thanks to Maxime Liquet, who helped with the data browser tool that you saw for the satellite imagery. Thank you, Martin, for the presentation. Uh, I think we have a couple of questions for you in the chat. So I'm going to start with the first one, uh, which is, is there a roadmap of what file formats are being considered for future implementation? Do you see anything in the docs, which, by the way, are great? Uh, we have some ideas. It, it depends on where the best use cases come from. So for example, I would love to do this for astronomical data. I already mentioned FITS, but it was a very simple case for FITS. Um, the, and FITS file format is only used by astronomers, so it's not very far reaching, but it could be interesting. Another obvious one would be various medical imaging formats like DICOM and NIFTY or other image formats like uh, even JPEG. You could use often do have very large sets of JPEG files by the thousands in directories that might be readable as a single aggregate data set. But uh, yeah, come and tell us what you think should be done. Um, writing the pieces to scan files and find binary blocks is not difficult if there already is a Python interface to that kind of file. Uh, we have another question, uh, which is, if data set grows over time, say day over day, can the scan be done in a way that only has to process the new data? Uh, yes and no. So um, for the cases that we are doing in Pangeo Forge, the idea is to scan the individual files. Usually, um, if, it, if your data set is growing, it means new files, usually. Uh, so to keep the references for the individual files somewhere temporary, and those reference sets are much smaller than the files that they are references into. And then you only need to do the new files when they arrive and re-aggregate into a global data set. So that's one part of it. The other is I mentioned that currently we store these references in JSON, but it could be something else like SQLite would, would really lend itself to being able to update references and add references as they come in. But we haven't done that yet. All right, thank you for the answer. Uh, seems like Martin, we are almost at the time and uh, I would like to thank you for coming here and you know presenting your work and it was a pleasure to have you. Okay, thank you.